during that speech, I've sat in the Oval Office with both of the men who are running for president. And they are very different people. I explained that I never thought Donald Trump would embrace my vision or continue my policies, but I did hope, for the sake of the country, that he might show some interest in taking the job seriously. But it hasn't happened. He hasn't shown any interest in doing the work or helping anybody but himself and his friends or treating the presidency like a reality show that he can use to get attention. And by the way, even then, his TV ratings are, are down. So you know that upsets him. But the thing is, this is not a reality show. This is reality. And the rest of us have had to live with the consequences of him proving himself incapable of taking the job seriously. At least 220,000 Americans have died. More than 100,000 small businesses have closed. Millions of jobs are gone. Our proud reputation around the world is in tatters. Presidents up for re-election usually ask if the country is better off than it was four years ago. Well, I'll tell you one thing. Four years ago, you'd be tailgating here at the link instead of watching a speech from your cars. The only people truly better off than they were four years ago are the billionaires who got his tax cuts. Right now, as we speak, Trump won't even extend relief to the millions of families who are having trouble paying the rent or putting food on the table because of this pandemic. But he's been doing all right by himself. As it turns out, this was just reported in the last 48 hours. We know that he continues to do business with China because he's got a secret Chinese bank account. How is that possible? How is that possible? A secret Chinese bank account. Come, listen, can you imagine if I had, had a secret Chinese bank account when I was running for re-election? You think, you, think you think Fox News might have been a little concerned about that? They would have called me Beijing Barry. It is not a great idea to have a president who owes a bunch of money to people overseas. That, that's not a good idea. I mean, of the taxes Donald Trump pays, he may be sending more to foreign governments than he pays in the United States. His first year in the White House, he only paid $750 in federal income tax. Listen, my first job was at a Baskin Robbins when I was 15 years old. I think I might have paid more taxes that year working at a dispensing ice cream. How, how is that possible? How, how, how many people here paid less than that? It's possible, just possible now, that if, if, if you are living high on the hog and you only pay $750 in taxes, that maybe, just maybe, he might not know what working people are going through here in Pennsylvania. We cannot afford four more years of this, Philadelphia. But the good news is, right now you can choose change. Right now you can vote for my friend Joe Biden and his running mate Kamala Harris as the next president and vice president of the United States of America. Now Joe, Joe's no stranger to him. He, he's a native son. Scrappy kid from Scranton. You know him, and you know he knows you. But let me, let me tell you how I came to know him and, and, and how I came to love him. Twelve years ago, when I chose 
when I chose Joe Biden as vice president, uh, as, as my vice presidential running mate. I didn't know Joe all that well. We had served in the Senate together, but we weren't super close. He and I came from different places. We came from different generations. But I came to admire Joe as a man who has learned early on to treat everybody he meets with dignity and respect. Living by the words his parents taught him. No one's better than you, Joe, but you're better than nobody. And that empathy, that decency, that belief that everybody counts, that's who Joe is. That's who he'll be. And I can tell you the presidency doesn't change who you are, it reveals who you are. And Joe has shown himself to be a friend of working people. For eight years, Joe was the last one in the room when I faced a big decision. He made me a better president. And he's got the character and experience to make us a better country. And he and Kamala are going to be in the fight, not for themselves, but for every single one of us. Look, I get that this president wants full credit for the economy he inherited and zero blame for the pandemic that he ignored. But you know what? The job doesn't work that way. Tweeting at the television doesn't fix things. Making stuff up doesn't make people's lives better. You've got to have a plan. You've got to put in the work. And along with the experience to get things done, Joe Biden has concrete plans and policies that will turn our vision of a better, fairer, stronger country into a reality. We literally left this White House a pandemic playbook that would have shown them how to respond before the virus reached our shores. They probably used it to, I don't know, prop up a wobbly table somewhere. We don't know where that playbook went. Eight months into this pandemic, cases are rising again across this country. Donald Trump isn't suddenly going to protect all of us. He can't even take the basic steps to protect himself. Just last night, he complained up in the area that the pandemic made him go back to work. I'm quoting it. He was, he was upset that the pandemic made him go back to work. If he'd actually been working the whole time, it never would have gotten this bad. So look, he, he, here's the truth. I, I want to be honest here. This pandemic would have been challenging for any president. But this idea that somehow this White House has done anything but completely screw this up is just not true. I'll give you a, a very specific example. Korea identified its first case at the same time that the United States did. At the same time, their per capita death toll is just 1.3% of what ours is. In Canada, it's just 39% of what ours is. Other countries are still struggling with the pandemic, but they're not doing as bad as we are because they've got a government that's actually been paying attention. And that means lives lost. And that means an economy that doesn't work. And just yesterday, when asked if he'd do anything differently, Trump said, not much. Really? Not much? Nothing you can think of that could have helped some people keep their loved ones alive? So Joe's not going to screw up testing. He's not going to call scientists idiots. He's not going to host a super spreader event at the White House. Joe will get this pandemic under control with a plan to make testing free and widely available, to get a vaccine to every American cost-free and to make sure our frontline heroes never to ask other countries for the equipment they need. His 
plan will guarantee paid sick leave for workers and parents affected by the pandemic and make sure that the small businesses that hold our communities together and employ millions of Americans can reopen safely. You know, Donald, Donald Trump likes to claim he built this economy, but America created 1.5 million more jobs in the last three years of the Obama-Biden administration than in the first three years of the Trump-Pence administration. How you figure that? And that was before he could blame the pandemic. Now, he did inherit the longest streak of job growth in American history. But just like everything else he inherited, he messed it up. The economic damage he inflicted by botching the pandemic response means he will be the first president since Herbert Hoover to actually lose jobs. Jo Joe's got a plan to create 10 million good, clean energy jobs as part of a historic $2 trillion investment to fight climate change, to secure environmental justice. And he'll pay, he'll pay for it by rolling back that tax cut for billionaires. And Joe sees this moment not just as a chance to get back to where we were, but to finally make long overdue changes so that our economy actually makes life a little easier for everybody. The waitress trying to raise her kid on her own. The student trying to figure out how to pay for next semester's classes. The ship worker who's always on the edge of getting laid off. The cancer survivor who's worried about her pre-existing conditions protections being taken away. Let me tell you something, Pennsylvania. This I know to be true. Joe and Kamala will protect your health care and expand Medicare and make insurance more affordable for everybody. You know, re Republicans love to say right before an election that they'll protect your pre-existing conditions. Now, Joe and I actually protected your policies to make sure people with pre-existing conditions could get health insurance and have coverage. We did it through something called the Affordable Care Act, a.k.a. Obamacare. And Republicans tried to repeal or undermine it more than 60 times. And when they've been asked about that, they keep on promising, we're going to have a great replacement. They said, it's coming. It's been coming in two weeks for the last 10 years. Where is it? Where, where is this great plan to replace Obamacare? They've had 10 years to do it. There is no plan. They've never had one. Instead, they've attacked the Affordable Care Act at every turn, driving up costs, driving up the uninsured. Now they're trying to dismantle your care in the Supreme Court as we speak as quickly as they can in the middle of a pandemic with nothing but empty promises to take its place. It's shameful. The idea that you would take health care away from people at the very moment where people need it most, what is the logic of that? There is no logic. Joe knows that a first, the first job of a president is to keep us safe from all threats, foreign, domestic, or microscopic. When the daily intelligence briefings flash warning signs about a virus, a president can't ignore him, he can't be AWOL. Just like when Russia puts bounties on the heads of our soldiers in Afghanistan, the commander in chief can't be missing in action. I, I can tell you this. Joe Biden would never call the men and women of our military suckers or losers. Who does that? He knows these, these heroes are, are somebody's children, somebody's spouse, somebody's dad or mom. He understands that. And he's going to restore our standing in the world because he knows that America's true strength 
comes from setting an example that the world wants to follow. A nation that stands with democracy, not dictators. A nation that can mobilize and inspire others to overcome threats like climate change and terrorism and, and poverty and disease. And with Joe and Kamala at the helm, you're not going to have to think about the crazy things they said every day. And that's worth a lot. You're not going to have to argue about them every day. It just won't be so exhausting. You, you might be able to have a Thanksgiving dinner without having an argument. You'll be able to go about your lives knowing that the president is not going to retweet conspiracy theories about secret cabals running the world or, or that Navy SEALs didn't actually kill bin Laden. Think about that. The president of the United States retweeted that. Imagine. What? What? We're not going to have a president that goes out of his way to insult anybody who doesn't support him or, or, or threaten them with jail. That's not normal presidential behavior. We wouldn't tolerate it from a high school principal. We wouldn't tolerate it from a, a coach. We wouldn't tolerate it from a co-worker. We, we wouldn't tolerate it in our own family except for maybe crazy uncle somewhere, you know. He, yeah, he's, 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 I mean, we, why would we expect and ex accept this from the President of the United States? And how, why are folks making excuses for that? Oh, well, that's just, that's just him. No, it's, no. There are consequences to these actions. They embolden other people to be cruel and divisive and racist. And it frays the fabric of our society. And it affects how our children see things. And it affects the ways that our families get along. It affects how the world looks at America. That behavior matters. Character matters. And by the way, while he's doing all that, it distracts all of us from the truly destructive actions that his appointees are doing all across the government, actions that affect your lives. You know, the Environmental Protection Agency that's supposed to protect our air and our water is right now run by an energy lobbyist that gives polluters free reign to dump unlimited poison into our air and water. The Labor Department, that's supposed to protect workers and their rights. Right now it's run by a corporate lobbyist who's declared war on workers guts protections to, to keep essential folks safe during a pandemic. Makes it easier for big corporations to shortchange them on their wages. The Interior Department, that's supposed to protect our public lands and wild spaces, our, our wildlife and our wilderness. And right now that's run by an oil lobbyist who's determined to sell them to the highest bidder. You've got the Education Department that's supposed to give every kid a chance, and that's run by a billionaire who guts rules designed to protect students from getting ripped off by for-profit colleges and stiff-armed students looking for loan relief in the middle of an economic collapse. I mean, the person who runs Medicaid right now is doing their best to kick people off of Medicaid instead of sign them up for Medicaid. Come on. When Joe and Kamala are in charge, they're not going to surround themselves with hacks and lobbyists, but they're going to appoint qualified public servants who actually care about looking out for you, for your job, for your family, for your health, for your security, for your planet. 
And that, more than anything, is what separates them from their opponents. They actually care about every American, including the ones that don't agree with them. And they're going to fight for you every day. They care about you, and they care about this democracy. They believe in a democracy. The right to vote is sacred. And that we shouldn't be making people wait in line for 10 hours to cast their ballot. We should be making it easier for everybody to vote. They believe that no one, especially the president, is above the law. They understand that protest on behalf of social justice isn't un-American. That's the most American thing there is. That's how this country was founded, protesting injustice. They understand we don't threaten our political opponents, threatening to throw them in jail just because we disagree with them. They understand that our ability to work together to solve big problems like a pandemic depends more than on just photo ops. It depends on actually learning the facts and following the science and not just making stuff up whenever it's convenient. We, we, our democracy is not going to work if the people who are supposed to be our leaders lie every day and just make things up. I mean, and we've just become numb to it. We just become immune to it every single day. Fact checkers can't keep up. And 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 look, this this notion of truthfulness and democracy and and citizenship and and being re responsible. These aren't Republican or Democratic principles. They're American principles. They're what we're, they're what we, most of us grew up learning from our parents and our grandparents. They're, they're not white or black or Latino or Asian values, they're American values, human values. And we need to reclaim them. We have to get those values back at the center of our public life. And we can, but but to do it, we've got to turn out like never before. We cannot leave any doubt in this election. Because you know, he, the president's already said, if it's even close, I'm going to just make stuff up. He's already started to do it. So we can't have any doubt. We can't be complacent. I don't care about the polls. There were a whole bunch of polls last time. Didn't work out because a whole bunch of folks stayed at home and got lazy and complacent. Not this time, not in this election. Not this time. Listen, listen, I, I understand why a lot of Americans can get frustrated by government and can feel like it doesn't make a difference. Even supporters of mine during my eight years, there were times where stuff we wanted to get done didn't get done. And people said, well, you know, gosh, if, if Obama didn't get it done, then, you know, maybe it's, it's just not going to happen. Look, government is not going to solve every problem. It's true. Every elected official is going to make some mistakes. This is a big, complicated country. And the system's designed so that change happens slowly. It doesn't happen overnight. And, and believe me, I've got firsthand experience with the way Republicans in Congress abuse the rules to make it easy for special interests to stop progress. But we can make things better. And we, sh we sure shouldn't be making things worse. A president by himself can't solve every challenge in a global economy. But if we've got Joe Biden and Kamala Harris in the White House and a House and Senate that are focused
focused on working people, it can make a difference and get millions of people the help they need. A president by himself can't eliminate all racial bias in our criminal justice system, but if we've got district attorneys and state's attorneys and sheriffs and police chiefs focused on equality and justice, it can make things better. In Pennsylvania, you just got to flip nine seats in your state house, just five seats in your state senate to give Democrats control and new life for policies that'll make a real difference to working families right now. They can make things better. And, and it, it, in the end, Pennsylvania, that's what voting's about. Making things better. Not making things perfect, but putting us on track so that a generation from now we can look back and say, things got better starting now. And that's what voting's about. Voting's about using the power we have and pooling it together to get a government that's more concerned and more responsive and more focused on you and your lives and your children and your grandchildren and future generations. And the fact that we don't get 100% of what we want right away is not a good reason not to vote. It means we've got to vote and then get some change and then vote some more and then get some more change and then keep on voting until we get it right. And we will never come close to seeing what it would be like if everybody voted. When I hear people say, well, I, I don't know, you're voting it doesn't make a difference. We don't know because usually no more than half the people who could be voting vote. We get 50, 55% of people voting and then people say, oh, look, you know, not enough change happened. Well, imagine what would happen if 60% voted. What about 70%? Imagine January 20th when we swear in a president and a vice president who have a plan to get us out of this mess, who believe in science and have a plan to protect this planet for our kids and who care about working Americans and have a plan to help you start getting ahead, and who believe in racial equality and gender equality, and, and believe in not discriminating against people because of their sexual orientation, and are willing to bring us closer to an America where no matter what we look like and where we come from and who we love and what our last name is, if we go out there and we work, we can make it. <laughs> 